Well, good. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that warm welcoming. I appreciate that introduction. Yeah, I was asked ahead of time uh, how I would like to be introduced or how I would like to be known. Should it be captain or doctor or dean or director or whatever? I just said, nah, just say he's a good guy. So <laughs> that, that's where all of that came from. Hey, thank you so much for inviting me to be out this morning with you at your Incosi conference. I understand it's off to a really, really good start. You guys have had several days of, uh, of good presentations. Like I know you have more good ones coming along here. I'm going to give you a presentation here in just a moment, as you heard during the introduction. And uh, what I'm not going to do, of course, is to talk to you about systems engineering, because that's your expertise. You know more about that than, than, than I do. But what I'm going to do is go through the presentation here. I think we'll have some fun. And then we'll open up the floor and have some two-way conversation. And during that conversation, I think we can tie in perhaps some of my experiences and where NASA is going in the future and the role that systems engineers are certainly to play in that. But in the meantime, we're going to get started and have a little bit of fun here with the presentation. Long, long ago in a faraway place called Miami, I was born. And that upper left-hand picture there is my family way back in the 1950s. You can see my mom and dad there. Of course, they passed away. The young girl in the center is my big sister. She is retired. She taught school for 40 years and has been retired now for over 10 years. The little guy on the left of your screen is my baby brother. He's retired now. He's, he retired from the sheriff's department in Atlanta, Georgia. And the cutest one on the screen, <laughs> who is that little guy there? Yours truly. I don't even know how old I was. I'm guessing maybe four or five years old. I dug this picture. Actually, I ran across it by accident. And I thought I'd just throw it in. Now, fast forward. The upper right-hand picture, the night of high school graduation, we finished the ceremony uh, on the way to the ceremony. And that's a mock-up diploma in my hand. My dad took this picture in the living room. Uh, a, a separate from the ceremony, but high school graduation. And uh, let's see, gradu I grew up in Miami, born and raised in Miami, Florida, and graduated from Coral Gables High School. Now, the lower center picture, fast forward another a number of years, I finished college. I've been in the Navy for approximately eight years, then I'm being promoted to lieutenant commander. The, the gentleman you see there holding my collar is my commanding officer in the, the airplanes we fly in the background there. Okay, I had a really interesting career. Actually, let's back up. All naval aviators are trained in fixed-wing airplanes. Everybody goes through all of the fixed-wing quals. But uh, I came in at the tail end of Vietnam, and a bunch of us got sent off to learn to fly helicopters. So I got to fly this one. This is the Navy's SH-2 Foxtrot. Now, that might not mean anything to you, but I can tell you it is an anti-submarine warfare helicopter. If you turn on the news, you hear a lot about ISIS, and you hear about some other uh, forces around the world, you know, but you don't hear much about submarines. But I can tell you there are a lot of people, some of them ugly, in the world that command submarines. And we need to be able to counter those submarines. We counter submarines a number of ways, with other submarines, with our own surface ships, with aircraft, and also helicopters. So that we carry a full suite of sensors aboard this helicopter. We could launch and land on destroyers, and we could detect, localize, track, and destroy submarines. We carry torpedoes. So I've landed over 200 times on the aircraft carrier, but I also have over 100 landings on a destroyer and a helicopter. Now, that's some tough flying, trying to land that thing and destroy it at night. You really earn your pay. Most of my flight time in the Navy was in this one, the F-14 Tomcat. That is the um, Top Gun airplane. If you're not familiar with airplanes, you're familiar with the movie. Everybody has. This is the one that Tom Cruise flew in the original Top Gun. Well, I got to fly it for real. Digress just a little bit. They're making a new Top Gun. Can you believe it? I just saw the trailer the other day, so we're going to have a whole lot of fun with that one. This is a real picture. It wasn't staged. I just landed from a test flight. I was a, a research development testing evaluation pilot in a Navy lab up in Warminster, Pennsylvania. All right, we got some, yeah, some Warminster people here. Anyway, some young DC folks. And um, I had just landed from a project flight, and the photographers took this picture. I honestly don't remember why, because they don't stand around and take your picture when you land. I suspect it was because I had just been selected by NASA 
by astronaut training, and they weren't going to put this picture in the company newsletter. So anyway, that's a, a real picture. Hey, take a look at that. Don't I look exactly the same now <laughs> as I did then? <laughs> Haven't changed one bit. Hey, you guys are good. I love it. Two space shuttle missions. The upper left-hand picture is my Endeavor crew. Spent nine days on Endeavor with these folks. Endeavor was the newest of the shuttles. Some of you may know this. The lower right-hand picture was my Columbia crew. Columbia was the oldest. Spent 16 days in orbit on Columbia. Uh, six guys on the first one, five guys and one woman on the second one. As you can see, uh, international crews, and you know this, everything we do in space these days is international. Well, this is the my international crews back during the space shuttle days. Uh, okay, let's see what's next here. How about uh, everybody on the shuttle and the station nowadays have many things that they're responsible for, and, and so did I. I had two primary jobs on my shuttle missions, though. I was mission specialist, too, and MS-2 is, is kind of like a flight engineer, so I was part of the flight deck crew. The three people that actually operated the vehicle, the command of the pilot and MS-2. And in my case, if uh, the contingency was that something happened to the command of the pilot would move the commander seat, I would move to the pilot seat and so on. So I went through all of the uh, actual flight training to operate the shuttle and actually as flight engineer during the mission. But my main job was EVA. So I got to put the spacesuit and go outside on the EVAs. And EVA, of course, is extravehicular activity. I'm going to say some things during the presentation, and many of you may already know this, so if you already know it, just bear with me. I'll go through and, and explain it for people who don't know. But the way we train for spacewalking or EVA is underwater, because as everybody does know, there's no such thing as a zero-gravity practice room. You can't go in and turn gravity off. You'd be surprised how many people ask me that. So what we do, <laughs> what we do is we put on a mock-up of the spacesuit, they call the EMU, the extravehicular mobility unit. We put on a mock-up of it, and we practice underwater what we're going to do in orbit. It's not exactly the same thing, but that's the best that we can do. So if you look at that upper left-hand picture, I'm on this side of the donning stand. My buddy is on the other side of the donning stand. Our trainers will get our helmets on, get our gloves on, get us all closed up inside the suit. And those yellow straps you see there are attached to a crane. The crane will pick us up and move us out and lower us into the water. The water is called, it's inside the neutral buoyancy lab, kind of a fancy swimming pool. And then what you don't see in the lower right hand picture there are the team of scuba divers, the divers under there to work with us. That suit weighs 350 pounds. That's right. So you can't swim or walk in a 350 pound suit. You need divers to help you to train and also they're there for your safety. If something goes wrong in the water, you depend on the scuba divers to get you out. The suit, once we're in the water, the divers will actually apply weights to our arms and legs so that the suit is neutrally buoyant. You know, it won't rise, it won't set, it's settle in the water. The water floats the suit and you pretend you're in weightlessness. Again, not the same thing, but that's the best that we can do. We spend a lot of time underwater practicing what we're actually going to do in orbit. If you take a look at my right hand, you see I've got a tool kind of like your uh, power tool at home, an electric drill. It's called a pistol grip tool. It's a very, very sophisticated thing. I can dial in the number of turns I want and the torque that I want and just pull the trigger, and it will actually give me the turns to, to drive a boat or screw or whatever, and it will apply the proper amount of torque. Interesting thing about space, you have to anchor yourself no matter what you do. If you work this tool at a high torque and you don't anchor yourself, one or two things will happen. Either the tool will spin out of your hand or you spin the other direction, <laughs> just like on the cartoons. So you have to be careful or you become a, a forever known as a cartoon in space. But let's see what's next. This is my uh, Columbia crew in front of our T-38s. Those are the jets that astronauts fly when we travel and also when we train. I think you all know, but all active U.S. astronauts, astronauts based in America who are active live in Houston. Yeah, not Cocoa Beach. <laughs> you go home and you watch I Dream of Jeannie, and those old crazy astronauts live in Cocoa Beach. Real astronauts live in Houston. I could jump up in the morning, get in that thing, and an hour and a half later I'm landing in, at the Cape here at Kennedy Space Center train all day long, do meetings or whatever I need to do, jump in that thing an hour and a half later, I'm back in Houston. 
There's no way in the world you could do that in a commercial airliner. Jack, you outrun everything in the sky in these bad boys. It's like a Lamborghini in the sky. Yes, indeed. I tried to get them to let me keep one when I retired. <laughs> they said, no, you can go, but you got to leave the airplane here. So, anyway, that's the Columbia crew posing in front of our, uh, our T-38s. Let's see what's next. This is uh, the morning of launch. We finished breakfast. We're sitting at the breakfast table. And uh, what we'll do when we leave the table here is we'll go get our weather brief. We'll get our launching entry suits on. And then we'll go out to the launch pad where the uh, shuttle was waiting for us. This is probably five hours before actual liftoff at this spot here. And let's see. We'll jump ahead. We have our launch and entry suits on. These are the suits that we wear uh, we wore when we launched into orbit and when we returned from orbit. Once we're up there, we're in a shirt sleeve environment, just like this room, except those of us who do spacewalks, obviously, you have to put the, the space suit on. We're leaving crew quarters. Crew quarters is here at Kennedy Space Center. We've been quarantined for eight days. And during the eight days, you only eat what's prepared for you by the dietitians and only come in contact with people who've been cleared by the medical doctors. Obviously, you don't want the crew to get sick before going into orbit and you uh, want to sort of mentally prepare yourself for what you're about to do. You've been training for a year or more. You've been focusing on operations and on systems and malfunctions and flying and EVAs and all that stuff. And now you really sort of have to prepare yourself for what you're about to do because you get ready to do something that's really, it, it's, there's a whole lot to it. So you sort of mentally prepare yourself for it. This is probably four hours here before actual liftoff. What you don't see in the scene is the crew transport vehicle, the little silver bus we boarded right out to the launch pad, and the convoy of other vehicles. You've got the flight, uh, the uh, head astronaut, the weather pilot. You've got uh, the, the uh, security folks, the SWAT team, or the, the helicopters, Air Force uh, special ops overhead flying around to be sure no unauthorized people are in the area. So there's a whole convoy of vehicles there uh, to escort us out to the pad. We've jumped ahead. We're at the pad. It's my turn to climb in. We're at the 195-foot level. That hatch you see in the back is the actual hatch to Columbia. A couple of people are already inside, but because of where my seat was located, it was my turn to climb in next. These guys here are suit technicians. They'll help me get partially dressed. You can see I have my parachute on my back already, and then I'll climb in, and uh, there's an astronaut inside to help me get strapped in because uh, as you know, all rockets sit up on the tail, right? They're going to launch up, and they sit upright, not flat like an airplane. They sit upright, so you have to climb up and wiggle up into your seat with your feet up in the air. And it's an awkward thing to do, so you need somebody to help you. And there's a, a person inside to help you get strapped in, get your helmet on, get your gloves on, get your suit plugged in, get all that extemporaneous stuff removed from the shuttle before launch. This is probably three and a half hours of thereabout before actual liftoff. Now, we're going to jump ahead to liftoff seven seconds before departure. The ground launch sequence and computer would ignite the three main engines. If all three ignite and accelerate properly, and sometimes they don't, if all three come up to 100%, then the solid rocket boosters will ignite, and then you're off to the races. Rockets always look like they go up in slow motion on movies or even in real life when you watch it because it's so big. In reality, it jumps off the pad. You sit in there and you lie there in your seat, the clock hits zero, and boom, it kicks you in the backside. Surprised me on my first flight. Jumps off the pad, and uh, by the time you pass the top of the tower, you have exceeded 100 miles per hour. We pass Mach 1, roughly 45 seconds, and we continue to go faster and faster and faster. I can remember on both flights watching my gauges, I could see Mach 2. Mach 5, Mach 6, Mach 8, Mach 10, Mach 12, Mach 13, Mach 14, Mach 15, Mach 15.5. And then we continue to go faster and faster and faster until at some point Mach number doesn't mean anything. You're out of the atmosphere. And uh, we essentially go from zero miles per hour to 17,500 in only eight and one half minutes. It is an eye-watering ride. My first flight, we launched at night. So obviously it was dark outside. But uh, uh, about halfway through the ascent, I could look out and see the day half of the Earth coming. I'm not sure why that changed on its own, but this is a picture taken from Columbia's aft deck, and we're modeling our lucky shirts. Everybody on the crew bought one. And uh, this is the second ugliest shirt 
we could find in the Land's Inn shirt catalog. <laughs> and the reason we bought the second ugliest is because the ugliest one in the catalog was sold out. <laughs> I kid you not. So we bought the lucky shirts and we we're modeling them from orbit and obviously they worked because we had a very successful time up there. So if you're concerned about anything, if life is not treating you right, if the boss isn't treating you too good, your dog ran away, your mother-in-law isn't treating you good, go buy yourself a lucky shirt. And I guarantee a very good and positive outcome to whatever it is that's bothering you. This is one of the payloads that we took in orbit with us. Uh, and we, in fact, yeah, it's, it's moving. A, a uh, Spartan 206 solar observation satellite, 3,000 pound, $10 million satellite. The young woman there is Dr. Kalpana Chavla from uh, India. We called her KC for short. KC was our robot arm operator. And you, as you can see, KC is using the shuttle's robot arm to lift that satellite up out of the payload bay, placing it in the orbit. Our job was to take it up there initialize it, place it in the orbit, and then back away from it for 48 hours. We'd go off and do something else. And during that 48 hours, it would make measurements of the sun's corona. Then we'd fly back up to it. She would use the robot arm to grab it, put it back into the payload bay, and we'd, we'd bring it home. And then after flight, scientists could download its data and learn more about the sun. Well, the satellite malfunctioned. Its attitude control system did not initialize properly, and it developed a spin in space. So you've got a satellite about the size of a small car very slowly turning in space. And as you all know what complex motion is, the thing was turning with complex motion. It would turn in one direction, then undergo a nutation in a different direction, another nutation, another direction. So you've got a 3,000 pound thing sort of wobbling all over space. Well, because it was turning, we couldn't catch it with the robot arm. But the thing cost $10 million. So we could just leave it up there as a piece of space junk. I don't know about you, but my American Express would not handle $10 million <laughs> worth of expenses to reimburse the government. So long story short, it was decided that to get it back, my buddy and I would go out and catch it by hand on a spacewalk. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go forward. Speaking of my buddy and I, the guy on the right of the screen is Dr. Takao Doi, Japanese astronaut. Takao was on his first space flight. He was my spacewalking buddy. In fact, Takao became the first Japanese astronaut to walk in space. We're here in the airlock, and we're, we are preparing to go outside on that first space walk. Before we put the EMU on, or the spacesuit, we have to put on the appropriate undergarment. This thing is called a liquid cooling and ventilation garment, or an LCVG. And, uh, what it does is help stabilize your body temperature when you're outside as you go around the Earth. You probably know this already, but we, in orbit, we circle the Earth approximately every 90 minutes. So you've got 45 minutes in direct sunlight, and it's very, very hot. It can be 200 degrees Fahrenheit or thereabout. On the dark side of the Earth, it can be minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, obviously your body can't withstand those temperatures, so the suit has to stabilize your body temperature, and it's done by pumping conditioned water through this liquid cooling and ventilation garment. It circulates that conditioned water all up and down your body to stabilize the temperature. So we put the LCVG on, and then we put the EMU, the extravehicular mobility unit, or the space suit on over the LCVG. And it looks kind of like this. I've got everything on but the helmet there. You can see the big backpack. I've got primary oxygen, secondary oxygen radios in there. I've got uh, a computer on the front of the suit to monitor suit functions and to tell me how things are going. I can read all kinds of parameters from the suit, from the uh, suit functions on the computer screen down below my, my head there. I've got earphones, microphones. Notice how big and bulky those gloves are. All the tools that we use outside have to be specially designed so that you can handle them with those big, bulky, pressurized gloves. Anyway, we've got the, we'll get our helmets on and we'll uh, depressurize the airlock and go outside. Now, there's a whole lot more to that I'm telling you, obviously. We start the process for EVA the night before, and then uh, putting the suit on, from the time you start to put the suit on to go outside, it's probably two hours, two and a half hours. There's a whole lot more to the process thing I just talked about, but uh, let's see what's next. Okay, just a picture of me with a complete suit on. You can see what it looks like, but this thing that I'm launching here uh, looks like a soccer ball. In fact, every once in a while, 
I'll tell people that this is my Orlando Magic tryout folder. <laughs> Basketball players are always bragging about how much hang time they have. <laughs> I have 24 days of hang time. <laughs> However, the Orlando Magic did not uh, recruit me. I'm, I'm not playing basketball. I'm here with you dudes. And I'm glad to be here. But uh, this thing is not really a basketball or a soccer ball. It is a robot. And its eyes are stereoscopic television cameras. Everything the robot sees can be beamed back into the shuttle or station or mission control or whatever. And the idea is, is that you launch this thing. It can inspect the outside of your vehicle or your space station. And then if you detect damage, you can figure out how to repair it, either send people out to repair it or whatever. So it was a fun project uh, to, to fly. And I, what I did was take it out and initialize it and run it through some, self, some tests and then launch it. And our pilot actually flew it through a test profile. And then I caught it again, powered it down, and brought it inside. So it was a fun project and a very, very useful project. Unfortunately, we did not have this on Columbia in 2003. Had they continued the development and had this on board, they might have been able to identify the damage and maybe do something about it. Anyway, fun, fun pro project. Okay, and just another picture of a, a, a cow and I outside with the complete EMU on. Uh, you can see my, I'm on the left and Takao is on the right. If, in case you don't know, the way you tell us apart in space, my suit has stripes on it. See the stripes on the legs? That's how you tell me and Takao's suit is clean. Otherwise, we look the same. This is a picture. Uh, this picture is taken through the rear window, so we're looking at the tail of the shuttle, but we're flying backwards away from you into the screen. We're on the dark side of the orbit, and we're a approaching orbital sunrise. The upper left-hand corner where that bright glow on the horizon is, that's the sun starting to peak up over the horizon. If this were moving, you see the sun come up over the horizon and then 45 minutes later it would set behind you. So again, 16 sunrises and sunsets every 24 hour period of time for us in orbit. Let's see what's next. Oh, the satellite. I told you we were gonna catch it manually. So we jumped way ahead in the timeline we were outside. I'm on the left. Takao is on the right. Our commander has flown us up to this spot where we jumped ahead again now. We've rendezvoused with the satellite. We rotated the shuttle. I grabbed my end. Takao has his end. And we're very slowly rotating that 3,000-pound satellite forward, an attempt to lock it into the payload bay and bring it home. When we were doing this, I can remember when we were doing it, the vertigo was incredible because we flew up to it and the earth was flat beneath us just like the earth is normally in here in this room and on earth but when we began to, I, I gave Kevin I was directing our commander Kevin Kriegel how to position the shuttle and I said Kevin we need to rotate the shuttle to port uh, left of, uh, for those of you, you civilians <laughs> and as he began to rotate the shuttle I could see the earth begin to tilt out of the corner of my my peripheral vision but what happens when the earth tilts you feel as though you're falling so I, I tried to instinctively right myself, but I'm attached to the shuttle. I can't right myself. And the vertigo, the, the disorientation was beginning to get really, really severe. And then I remember, and I, was, I was concerned, I said, my goodness, I'm, we might not be able to get this done. But uh, in the shorter time that it tells me to tell this, I remember thinking back to Navy, basic Navy instrument training, well, when you're training, when, when you get vertigo, they always taught you to ignore your feelings, to tune them out and trust your instruments. Then I'm thinking, I don't have any instruments up here. But then I thought, well, wait a minute. The satellite's stable. It's not going anywhere. It is rock solid. So I focused all my attention on the satellite and tuned out my peripheral vision. And then you see this picture here where the Earth is vertical to us out of the, the corner of my eye, and we, we caught the satellite. You saw probably 10 seconds of what it took three and a half hours to do. That was a long process, and this was a long spacewalk. In fact, this was almost eight hours. at seven hours and 53 minutes, I think it was. I had a 30-minute warning light come on on my suit telling me it's time to stop and go inside because you've got, you're getting low on one of the consumables that, that controls suit functions. But uh, anyway, this was a, a, a really an, a incredible experience to get this done, to bring that thing back. It was repaired and sent up on a subsequent space shuttle mission. Let's see what's next. Oh, I have to digress a little bit. I told you about the lucky shirts. 
This picture here, when I first retired from active duty, and I started going around giving presentations, this picture got in there kind of by accident, and I was going to take it out because it has no scientific value to it. It has no real operational value to it. It just was a fun picture. I was at the end of a spacewalk, floating up to the window. I was waving it, and then they took this picture. Man, this picture turns up everywhere. <laughs> if you Google me, this picture will come up. This picture is on mouse pads, it's on bookmarks, it's on posters. I have visited people's homes and found one of those coffee table books. Open the coffee table book in the index, find my name, turn to that page, that picture. A friend of mine visited the Museum of Science in London, England. This was several years ago. Brought back a photograph of herself in front of a 12-foot mural. Guess what's on the mural? That picture. But the real reason I leave that picture in there is because it has spiritual and divine implications. How many of you remember those fans you get in church? You know, you go to church and you, you, it's on a stick and you got a cardboard thing and you fan like this. That's right. Yeah, you remember. You guys aren't saying that. You know what I'm talking about. Sitting in church one Sunday absorbing the word, the light shining down on me. All of a sudden, some motion over here catches my attention. I look over there, I just about to have a heart attack. This lady has a fan. Guess what's on the fan? <laughs> that picture. Now, I know, some of you are saying, oh, that's a cute story. He's, he's so much fun. He just has all of it. But dudes, the kid never exaggerates. <laughs> As only one person's picture should be in church. So if mine shows up there, it stays everywhere. I'm going to leave it in this presentation. So we have a lot of fun with that. Okay, I think we're at the end of our 16 days. We're getting ready to come home. We do what's called the deorbit burn. Burn means we fire the orbital maneuvering systems engine so that we can leave orbit. At one point during the reentry profile, we're going so fast the air actually ionizes. That bright glow you see there is just hot plasma generated because we're going so fast through the air. This is somewhere around Mach 20. We exceeded Mach 25 on reentry. This is Mach 20 and 200,000 feet or thereabout. The temperature outside is in the thousands of degrees. The hottest part is around 3,000 degrees. We're comfortable. See, we have the suits on, the helmets on inside. The environmental control and life support system is working properly, and we're riding inside of this, this big fireball. Later on in the profile, we're overhead Kennedy Space Center getting ready to land, and this is the view through the front windscreen. Uh, the, you know this. It's called a heads-up display, a head-up display, and it generates all of your flight data in front of you so that uh, it, it can be seen while, you, while you're flying. The commander's actually doing the flying here, and we're just about ready to touch down. Uh, the shuttle, as you know, had no engines. It was a big glider on final, so it had to be landed properly the first time, and again, I command a, Kevin Kriegel was doing the flying. Steve Lindsay was the pilot. I was the flight engineer. And uh, Kevin just does a nice job of giving us a, a nice smooth landing. So we've come from orbit on the opposite side of the Earth, re entered the atmosphere, and dissipated all of that energy in a controlled manner and hit a spot on the ground, all with no engines. And we can do that, obviously, because of all the folks that designed it. The aerodynamics people, the flight control people, the uh, navigation people, the computer program people, all of those folks all came together. And of course, here's where your systems engineering are one example of all, all of those different disciplines integrated together to make it possible for a person to fly from orbit and land on the ground. Astronauts' job was easy. The hard part was done by the engineers and by the people that pull this whole thing together. And uh, of course, we got a nice, smooth, and safe landing. Once you land this thing, you can't just stop and open the door the way you do an airliner. We have to power down its systems. And the commander had some, pilot had some, I had some. It takes about 45 minutes to power down each individual system and transfer shuttle power to ground support power. And when the 45 minutes is up, the first person to, to come in is the doctor. Flight surgeon wants to come in uh, to, to the orbit or check us out and talk to us, see how we're doing. If everybody's doing okay, 
we make our way off of the shuttle in seclusion, and then we begin to reacclimate. And it's done in seclusion because some people don't uh, adjust quite as quickly as other people. So it's done in a controlled manner in seclusion. And when we leave the shuttle, a ground-based astronaut will come into the shuttle and continue to power down its systems and transfer power over to uh, the ground. And uh, if you look in the background there, you can see the trucks and the gr ground people and the equipment that's hooked up to the orbiter. This picture was taken several hours after we got back. We've taken off the uh, launching entry suits, the big orange suits. We put on regular blue flight suits. We're comfortable. Everybody's feeling okay. They've got the land legs back, and we come back out, and we take pictures like this one. You see six happy faces back from 16 days in orbit. Now, of course, you know the shuttles have been retired. They've been retired for a number of years, and some of you may know, others may not know what's next for NASA, of course, is the space launch system. The Orion capsule is under development. We've had two test flights on the Orion capsule. The uh, propulsion part is under development and being tested. So the Orion uh, architecture will take us off to the moon because that's the next goal for us. The president has declared that NASA will put people on the moon by 2024. The project is called Artemis. Now remember the original project 50 years ago was Apollo. Artemis, in case you don't remember your mythology, is Apollo's sister. So the big thing these days is that there will most definitely be the first woman on the moon in 2024. And after that, yeah, absolutely. And of course, international <laughs> partners. So the uh, we'll go back to the moon with a permanent colony this time so that we can learn how to live and work in space. And that will serve as a stepping stone to put people in, on Mars by the end of 2030. The Artemis program has been blessed. It's been decreed and money has been funded. A timeline has been put together. Specific architecture is being developed. Contracts have been awarded. So unless something unusual happens, we will put people on the moon again by 2024. Uh, you already know this too, uh, uh, most of you do, but for those who don't know, the International Space Station is currently being serviced by Russians and our international partners. We fly back and forth to the International Space Station with our Russian partners. Uh, SpaceX is doing a lot of the uh, resupply and other commercial companies. So overall, the uh, America's space program is looking real good and we're gonna be putting American astronauts in space from American soil here again soon. The first company that will launch U.S. astronauts will probably be SpaceX. They were slated to begin that process this year. Probably won't happen this year. They've got a couple of test flights to do. They've had some delays. It'll probably be out in the next year when they, if they have successful test flights, they'll launch the first crew, crewed vehicles up to the International Space Station. Boeing is also in the running. SpaceX and Boeing both uh, have vehicles that have been been contracted to launch American astronauts. The crews have already been selected to fly on the Boeing uh, CST-100 and also on the SpaceX Dragon. So we're doing a lot of good things and a lot of good things are, are happening in the future. Uh, people who are not connected to this area sometimes think when the shuttles retired, the space program sort of shut down. No, 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 it's very active. We have typically 30 to 40 launches a year from Kennedy Space Center. They just don't have people on them. So you don't get as much attention as you do when they're people. But no, it's very active, doing a lot of good things in a lot of good places. Now, I'm almost done with the formal part of the presentation. But I mentioned going back to the moon and going off to Mars. That's going to be a tremendous undertaking. The things we did on the moon are, are, are 50 years old. We're going to have to sort of relearn some things and redevelop some things. And as we go off to Mars, a place we've never been, there are challenges that we can only begin to anticipate what they might be and how to solve them. But I can certainly see a very, very strong and improved role for people who are trained in systems engineering uh, in the success of those two endeavors. And by systems engineering, I mean, and I'm not a systems engineer trained person myself, but I'm not just talking about the architecture of the uh, technology. I'm talking about a complete system uh, where how are we going to develop a community on the moon? Looking at the community as a system and taking a systems engineering approach to that. How, I believe one of the most difficult problems we're going to face in going off to Mars is not so much the technology. We know how to navigate, we know how to build propulsion systems. We don't know how to handle people and how to handle, and how to handle the human side of it. Is there a systems engineering approach that can be applied 
to a community of people that, that are going off to do something unusual. I don't know that, but you might know that. And that's something that you guys can, can think about because that, I think, is going to be one of the, the crucial parts in the successful mission to Mars and back and successful long-term duration in space. Let me stop right now with the formal presentation. We're going to do the Q&A here in just a minute. But thank you for your attention. You've been a wonderful audience. And we'll do some Q&A here in just a little bit.